In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. My dear friends in Christ, my parents introduced me to camping at a very young age. In fact, after they had gotten married, they went on a honeymoon and they did a big backpacking trip in Banff National Park up in Canada. Beautiful place, beautiful country. And they passed that experience on down to me and, and that enjoyment of it. And so when I got married, I thought I would introduce my wife to the joys of camping. Now, it's not that my wife had never spent any time in a tent before. That's, she had. But to drive out into the wilderness and to find some state park and, and pitch a tent and stay there for a couple days, that was kind of new to her. So where did I take her? Well, I took her up to 10,000 feet in the mountains of Colorado for her very first camping trip in the month of May. Now, if you've never been to the mountains in the month of May at 10,000 feet, there's still snow on the ground. Yeah? And, and it gets pretty cold at night, like below freezing. And so there we were, and my poor wife, shivering all night long. It was not a good time. Not, needless to say, there was not much joy in that camping trip. And I suspect there's some of you who probably feel the same way about camping. Right? I mean, if you think about it, right, we, we, we're going to go on a trip in which we remove all of the modern conveniences that we've come up with over the last hundred or so years. We're going to live in this flimsy little tent amongst all the bugs and dirt and animals of the forest and try and survive on what we bring with us. Hey, hey that sounds great. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm sure some of you feel like that about camping. Right? You'd rather go to a hotel, to a water park, to, to go to a spa, some place where you get some luxuries that you don't normally get every day. Then you've got some joy. I wonder, though, if we ever think about our lives that way. Like, like here's the little tent of my life with its flimsy walls and, and in some dingy campsite and, and out amongst all the dangers of this world and, and it's not very impressive and, and it's got some trouble and I don't think real highly of it. If only there was more experiences, if only there was more luxury or more stuff in my life, then maybe then I would start to have some joy in my life. Well, the Israelites were facing a, a kind of similar situation. In our, our section of scripture today from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, the Israelites are coming back to their ancestral lands around Jerusalem and Judea. They had been exiled from their country for about 70 years, and now they were coming back to resettle where they had come from. And what they found wasn't real good. Their cities and towns had been destroyed. The walls of the capital city of Jerusalem had been torn down. The temple had been destroyed. They had to rebuild it all. On top of that, they were under the authority of a foreign king. The king of Persia was ruling over them now. And on top of all of that, they knew that this was all their fault. As they gathered around Ezra the scribe, the, the priest, and he was sharing with them the word of God, they learned that they had fallen pretty far short of what God wanted them to do. They knew that it was their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their parents, who, who had caused all of that exile to happen. And now here they were, trying to put it all back together again. And as they listened to these words of the Lord, what could they do but weep and cry because they knew, they knew how much they had disobeyed God. But that wasn't what the Lord wanted for them. It wasn't what Nehemiah, their governor, wanted for them. He wanted them to have joy. Nehemiah said to them, Do not mourn, do not grieve, for this day is a, a day of celebration, a day of joy as you're listening to God's word, because the joy of the Lord will be your strength. He is your safe place. Your Lord is your sanctuary where you can go. You see, the people have been gathering around and listening to Ezra read from the Bible. 
it says here that they were reading from the law. And that's a fine translation of the word here. But the word is actually the Torah. And, and the word Torah in Hebrew comes from a word which means to throw or to cast. And that, that word, throwing and casting, became associated with teaching. That may seem like a stretch, but hear me out. What do teachers do all the time? They point, right? They throw their hand out and they point at things. They, 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 they show you with their finger. They throw this hand out all the time. And so this throwing motion became associated with teaching. And so the Torah is the teachings of God, their scriptures, their Bible. And as they listened to these scriptures of God, they heard two distinct messages that, that this whole thing centered around. And we see little clues to that in how the people react. They, they heard the message that they had fallen short of God's standard. And what did they do? They mourned, they wept, they cried because they knew that they had disobeyed God. But at the same time, Nehemiah gave them that message of hope and forgiveness that, that they were saved, that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. He was their savior. And how did they react to that message? Well, we see it here in verse, verse 12. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They understood who their Savior was. They understood that the Lord was the God who had rescued them from their sins. That he didn't want to just destroy them. But he wanted them to live with him in safety. And that gave them great joy. And then the next thing they do is kind of interesting. As they gather around that word and as they listen to that word, they learn about a festival that they're supposed to be celebrating. It's called the Festival of, of Tabernacles or the, the Feast of Booths. And I don't know if Ezra planned it out this way that, that at this time they were going to read this word or if it was just a coincidence. But they realized, hey, we're supposed to be celebrating this real soon. Now, the, the, the Festival of Tabernacles was celebrated around the time of the fruit harvest as you're pulling in stuff from the orchards and the vineyards. And it was a commemoration of how the Lord had watched over their ancestors when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And what they would do is they would go out and they'd, they'd get sticks and, and, and leaves and, and all this brush and they would build these little booths. Now, we don't really use the word booth in that way, right? When, when, when you hear the word booth, what do you think of? Like a ticket booth or like a booth at the fair, a vendor? That's not what we're talking about here. It's really a hut. I like that word better, hut. These little huts, and they would live in them for a week. They went camping. For a whole week, they went camping. And, and there in their little huts, they would celebrate that the joy of the Lord was their strength. So get this. Ezra and Nehemiah teach them from God's word that the Lord is their safe place. And then they celebrate a festival in which they reenact how the Lord is their safe place. And they are filled with joy as they celebrate because they know that the Lord is their strength. Listen to how Nehemiah talks about it in verse 17. The whole company that had returned from exile built booths, huts, and lived in them. From the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. Notice how Nehemiah describes the people. At first, they are the exiles, right? The castaways, the ones who had rejected God, the ones who, who were being punished by God because of their sins. But now they are what? The Israelites, the children of, of Jacob, the children of God, the children of the promise. These are the people now who had reconnected with their Lord. They understood him as their God who loved them and who had saved them. They were putting the pieces of their relationship with God back together. And their joy was very great. I don't know what it is that takes the joy out of your life. Some of you have, have shared with me the struggles you've gone through, whether it's it's relationship problems or, or marriage trouble or, or trouble with addictions or, or financial or medical problems. 
But these are the things that can suck the joy out of life, aren't they? We don't know where to go. We don't know where to turn. Or maybe you know somebody who, who's going through really hard time right now. And that joy of life is just being pulled away from them. What do we do? What can we do sometimes? But cry. But mourn. Like these people did. And, and maybe that's a good start. Now, now hear me out here. Maybe that's a good start because maybe, maybe we can take a few moments in our lives and, and just mourn and weep because the reason that the joy gets taken out of life is because of sin. My sin. The sin of the people around me. We live in a, a fallen and, and broken world and so maybe we should take a few moments and just mourn and realize that sin has brought a great bit of trouble for us in this world. What else can we do but mourn? We can make no claim to having any reason to rejoice on our own. What do we deserve except to be exiled by God and to shiver out in the cold? But can you listen to the words of your Lord through Nehemiah? Nehemiah reminds us, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do not grieve because it has pleased the Lord to save you from sin. Do not grieve because it makes God happy to show you mercy. Do not grieve because whatever you've done in your life, whatever has happened in the past, God forgives. Do not grieve because God has provided for you and for this whole world and, and for me a savior from sin. We're talking about Jesus here, aren't we? Right? These people didn't know it yet because Jesus hadn't come, but we know it, you know it. Jesus, the one who, who would be born to be king of this world, to be born king of all, to be born our savior. He's the one who came to rescue us from sin. He's the one who was born to redeem us and to pay for sin, to be the sacrifice so that God would punish him in your place and in mine and in the place of our children. There's no sacrifice that we could ever offer to God that would be enough, but Jesus is the one sacrifice that has paid for sin. We can go to him, weary and, and burdened, with all the troubles in our life, and we can, we can go to our Savior and take upon ourselves the yoke that he gives to us, the yoke of his love and forgiveness and peace and promise of eternal life, and we can take that yoke upon us and learn from him and his gentleness and his humble heart. And the more we understand the joy of the Lord, the more we understand that he is our refuge and our safe place, the greater our joy is. You think that's a, a joy that maybe is worth celebrating? I think so. How, how do we do that? Well, well, maybe, just like the Israelites, maybe we could go camping for a week and take that time celebrating that, that God protects us and, and watches over us and is our shelter in a stormy and, and difficult world. Maybe we could do that. That'd be one way. <laughs> Or maybe you can come to worship, and, and as you listen to the hymns, as you sing the hymns, or as you, you, you participate in the worship service, no matter what hymn is playing, no matter your own singing ability, you can sing with all of your heart, because you know that these hymns, these songs speak of your Savior, who is your joy and your safe place. Or, or, or maybe... Maybe what you could do is, is since you know people in your life and, and maybe you know somebody who is going through a tough time, maybe, maybe you can invite them to, to come with you to a worship service, to, to Christmas Eve service coming up or Christmas Day service or, or to one of our, our children's services like the one we had today a few minutes ago or, or the one we're having on, on Friday night this week at 6 o'clock in the gym or, or the one we're having on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 1045 with our Sunday school. Maybe you could invite people to come with you and to hear with you and to celebrate Celebrate with you the joy of a Savior born to take away sin. Or maybe it's just escaping for a little while into the hut of God, His sanctuary, the sanctuary of His Word, to, to steal away for a few moments to a quiet part of the house 
and just just to be in the presence of your Lord in his word and in prayer. The Israelites built these huts. They lived in them for a week. They went camping for a week because they wanted to celebrate how the Lord was their safe place. We have every reason to celebrate the same thing. We have the same Lord, the same promise, the same Savior, the same joy of eternal life, the same promise of forgiveness. It's all there. God invites you and me to dwell with him in the safety and sanctuary of his word. Rejoice. You live in a hut. Hoo-ha. Amen. <laughs>